that. So we'll move on to the, to the next uh, session, which is uh, going to be moderated by one of my best colleagues here, uh, Rita Goldstein. She's the director of the Brain Imaging Center. She's professor of uh, psychiatry. Uh, her work is focused on cocaine addiction and neuroimaging, and she'll moderate the session uh, for our next speaker. Introduce him, too. So thank you very much. It's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Mori, who's going to jumpstart our scientific sessions, the first being in neuroimaging. Professor Mori is uh, prof uh, he's from radiology, is the director of the Center of Brain Imaging Sciences in the Johns Hopkins University and School of Medicine. He has more than 20 years of experience in the study of the human brain anatomy using advanced MRI data acquisition and analysis. He especially has extensive experience in analysis of DTI and structural MRI data, developing one of the most widely used electronic human brain atlases using multi-contrast MRI data. He is one also of the pioneers of 3D white matter reconstruction techniques using DTI, and his lab is also widely known as the creator of DTI Studio, MRI Studio, which currently has more than 8,000 uh, users worldwide. Dr. Mori will talk with us and will present the gap in the past two decades between the considerable advancement of technologies for automated and quantitative image analysis tools for brain MRI images versus their adoption or slower adoption in routine radiological diagnosis. So join me in welcoming Professor Mori. Thank you, uh, and thank you for uh, inviting this symposium today. Uh, first of all, disclaimer, uh, me and uh, Dr. Miller, uh, co-founder of Anatomy Works, uh, which received federal small business grant and developed some of the web interfaces uh, I will present today. Now, uh, I want to talk about translational research of brain MRI. And uh, we have been doing almost for 10 years, and it has been very difficult. And today, uh, my presentation is to share our experience about uh, why it has been difficult rather than how su successful we are. So I want to talk about the challenges. And in the, at the very end of the presentation, if I have some time, I want to uh, demonstrate our new platform uh, called MRI Crowd. So uh, I have been uh, doing uh, this MRI study since beginning of 90, and I just uh, listed some of the technologies I was involved directly or indirectly as developer or a, a user. And uh, it has been truly a wonderful time. I have witnessed a huge explosion of the field, new technologies. And, but that about 10 years ago, I started to work with clinical division. And we, uh, the purpose was I wanted to implement uh, new imaging protocols uh, in clinical scans uh, so that in the future we can share and use clinical data, not only the research data, and we can apply the advanced image analysis tools uh, to this uh, rich clinical data. But then uh, what I found is that uh, uh, th their technology is, seems like uh, plateaued in the last 10 years uh, uh, in, in many cases. Uh, for example, uh, the field strength is stuck at 3.0 Tesla. Uh, we've been developing so many great uh, new contrasts, but uh, brain MRI is basically based on T1, T2 diffusion weighted image and flare and they are using three to five millimeter slice thicknesses. So I told them uh, they should adopt research grade uh, scanner. And now uh, it's about 30 minute scan and it, uh, with using uh, latest technology, we can make it in 35 minutes. It's just five minutes more. It should uh, not be that much burden for the uh, patient. But then they said, okay, that's fine, but uh, in microscope, point of view, uh, more than 10% uh, less patient can receive the MRI. Uh, the, the downside is 
tangible and imminent and what I can give to them. And I said, well, uh, volume-based uh, numbers of the brain volumes or structure volumes. And they said, OK, uh, come back later. So it, that has been uh, one of the difficulties. And then when it comes to how to read uh, the, uh, the images, it seems like it's stuck from the beginning of MRI. Uh, doctors just look at the images and do subjective judgment. So I really want to go into uh, these blue and red lines today uh, to dig a little deeper into it. So to, to begin with, what is translational research for MRI? Well, I do human scan, and I can immediately tell what I'm doing is translational research because of that, but I don't think many people buy it. Then uh, I say, well, I apply it to human diseases. This is translational research. But uh, I, I guess the one of the true <laughs> tests is whether uh, these new technologies we developed has been adopted and deployed in a clinical bedside. So if we think about diffusion tensor imaging, it is a success story because these days it is push or button. Uh, almost all MRI scanners uh, in the clinical uh, area have that. But uh, if we go one step further and ask, yes, but uh, does it really contribute to the human society? Does it really change a patient life by providing diffusion tensor imaging? I, I'm, uh, I'm not sure about that because uh, Many diseases, I, I don't know many diseases uh, that cannot be diagnosed by T1, T2, but by DTI. So if we go further and further, uh, we, we can see uh, the, the, the metric of uh, the success of uh, translational research is not very uh, easy. But anyway, when uh, we write grant, or at least I write grant, uh, the significant section uh, starts like this, because this is NIH grant, and uh, we want to show uh, some evidence of translatability. So we apply uh, our tool to study disease X, and there are Y number of patients in US each year, and it costs zillions of dollars in society. So our tool alpha is expected to be a biomarker of the disease X. And in, in all the days, if I put DTI in alpha, uh, I could get grant. It's no longer like that. And we can cut and paste the X. So to be honest, when uh, I was a student, postdoc, uh, developing DTI-related technique, uh, I'm doing because it's fun and intellectually challenging. Uh, without thinking uh, uh, too much about real translation. So this is just a, one of the phrases I have to write in the ground. Now, this is a real, my real life story. Uh, I have a good friend in neurology. Uh, he does stroke. And I got one of the idea. Uh, the X is now stroke. And I wanted to write grant uh, to apply DTI to stroke. And I talked to him. Uh, I want to work with you. And he said, why? Diffusion-weighted image and T2 can clearly show where the stroke. Good question. Uh, we can image which tract are damaged. In the day one, when patient is brought, I, we can see the infarction in diffusion-weighted image, and we can map white matter where is corticospinal tract, and we can immediately tell whether corticospinal tract is damaged or not. Isn't it cool? And he said, but. So what? Uh, well, can't you see? Because uh, we can predict the long-term outcome in day one. If uh, corticospinal tract is damaged, uh, most likely this person has a, a problem in motor function. We can predict. Uh, yeah, but uh, we have clinical information to predict the outcome. Uh, in day one, if the patient has severe symptom, it most likely he has or she has a severe symptom later, and it's very mild, uh, it's going to be mild. It's a good question. And then uh, I thought, okay, if we target only the se patient with severe symptom in day one, we know that there are some portion of those patients who recover 
and some of them do not recover. Maybe MRI can tell uh, who's a recoverer and who is not going to recover. I, I, after this conversation, I can see that my uh, project is uh, uh, design, study design is uh, more evolved and uh, the study purpose is more tight. And I said, thank you, uh, because of you, I, I, I can write better grant. Uh, better study design this, that is basically try to differentiate the, the uh, patient uh, with severe symptom in acute phase and we want to tell what's going to happen to them. But unfortunately he didn't stop there and he said <laughs> well that's good but we can differentiate recoverers from non recoverer within one or two weeks. If just wait one week, uh, if uh, the patient recovers, they already start to have symptoms. So after all these uh, great MRI, fancy DTI, data processing, statistical analysis, you buy me one week. So after this conversation, we start to understand that there are things like alternative methods, or economical sense, which we rarely think when I write this significant section. And so this is partly because of the problem of uh, tool developers uh, who uh, tends to stay in the silo and uh, uh, do not have much ability to go beyond there. Now, let's think about uh, whatever we are doing, what would be, uh, what would happen if everything goes as we dream? Well, it's sort of uh, end product. Well, one of the th thing we want to do is new insight into how our brain works. That's great, but I'm not sure this is translational research, at least not directly. Uh, we really want to apply uh, the tool to the disease to make it translational research. Uh, understanding the disease mechanism, this is a really nice goal. Although uh, MRI, uh, regular MRI is just uh, detecting signal from water, so it's very difficult to get the very direct evidence in cellular level, molecular level, gene level. So we really have to combine with other modalities to get a conclu uh, conclusion, usually. <laughs> but that's okay uh, if we want to develop a biomarker, surrogate marker to monitor progression of the disease, uh, evaluate the efficacy of drug intervention. But today, I really want to talk about improvement of radiological report and diagnosis. Uh, I believe more than 90% of MRI scans done every day is this radiology. So I want to focus on this last part as a target of translational research today. And then I really have to think about this disparity between research and clinical MRI. In terms of data acquisition, we want to develop technologies that is faster, higher resolution, better contrast. The speed is always gold. Uh, MRI scan used to be one hour, but now it's 30 minutes. It is really triumph of the translational research. But how about resolution and contrast? We keep developing all these great uh, contrast, but uh, few are, have been adopted in a, a daily clinical scan for brain. Uh, how about image analysis? Research has to be, we are told that it has to be quantitative, objective, statistic, group-based, while in the clinical, it's completely opposite. It's a qualitative, subjective judgment, and it has to be made for each individual. And if you look at the study design research, we have to have homogeneous patient group, otherwise we don't know what we are studying, while in clinical setting, no radiologist can say I see only purely homogenized <coughs> Alzheimer population. Research, we always need good control group. Clinical, we cannot say bring in age much control. Uh, consistent protocol is very important to increase the precision of the measurement, but uh, again, doctors cannot say I have been trained with Siemens so that I cannot read Philips. <laughs> so, this study design in the clinical is something like we have been taught not to do. So uh, I come back to this one and starts to 
uh, feel uh, why we haven't been able to make any, well, uh, only a little contribution to this blue line, image analysis technology. And uh, I want to focus on a little bit more. So in, in the beginning, what I felt is the it, it's ignorance of clinical side. Um, by not adopting uh, all these great uh, tools we have been developing to analyze images. But uh, the more and more I uh, into it, I start to feel that uh, maybe what we have to do is technology has to come closer to human. And if we want to tr do that, uh, immediately I start to see many, many walls that we hit. And it is not something uh, one uh, research expertise can solve. So that is one of the problems. Now, uh, so before I go a little deeper, I, I want to go over, go over uh, the data itself, uh, the nature of the data we have. Uh, and to, to do that, I want to uh, expand uh, the disease uh, into this uh, uh, axis of anatomical effect size, because I don't believe that we can develop one tool that can be applied to any diseases. So the left side is large effect size, and right side is, uh, is a small effect size. And in the daily radiological practice, uh, we deal with uh, diseases with large effect size so that we can visually see. To the right, uh, psychiatric uh, or developmental delay. Uh, I, in many cases, MRI is not uh, justified so that we don't even have MR, clinical MRI sometimes. And I, I believe what we are dealing with is this gray zone, like dementia. Uh, in many patients, we can visually see brain atrophy. But what is also common to this gray area zone diseases is that uh, all medical information, imaging or non-imaging, are weakly discriminating factor so that we really need quantitative research and statistical analysis and hopefully we can uh, translate this technology uh, to the radiological diagnosis, which hasn't been happened uh, very often. But anyway, the data looks like this. We have patient information and each patient carry this vector that consists of imaging, demography, clinical information, lab tests, genetic information. I, I use uh, uh, the different color for diagnosis and prognosis because usually uh, the left side is input parameter and right side, red one, is the information we know. And when the patient end comes, uh, we want to make a uh, decision about diagnosis. This is uh, one of the big data we have. And uh, as I said, in, in those gray zone diseases, the challenge is none of this is strongly discriminating factor. That means, for example, if this is Huntington disease, if we go right into genetics, we have very strong discriminating factor to, that leads to the diagnosis. But in many dementia, for example, if I pick any one of them, we cannot reach the diagnosis. So that is a challenge. So when we do the study design, we want to stratify the population into control or different type of uh, dementia, and one of them is Alzheimer's disease. But inherent difficulty is because none of the available data is strong enough. We cannot expect very uh, clean uh, stratification. If we can do very accurate stratification to identify AD from these information, m maybe we don't have to do uh, MRI research. So there is a fundamental difficulty here. Now. Anyway, when we do the conventional research design, we have patient population, and uh, with stringent inclusion criteria, we try to homogenize the population. We won't have a high quality age match control, and we do statistics like t-test. 
Now, we do that, uh, and, and one unique aspect of imaging is that we have to do it in every box cell, every brain location. And we have more than one million box cells with one millimeter resolution because brain is bigger than one liter. Now, so th those are how our data look like, and I wanna go to the challenges. And uh, one is uh, the paradigm shift, at least for me. So again, this is the conventional research design I have been taught how to do. But uh, in, in, in the clinical, there is no, as I said, there is no control data explicitly. We don't do statistical analysis. We don't homogenize population. And actually, uh, the, the clinical diagnosis purpose is to stratify the population. So th this arrow is one of the biggest goal of the clinical application. Now, then what doctors are doing, well, actually, this patient population information is stored in uh, their brain. Uh, during uh, the training, uh, they have been exposed uh, three to 5,000 teaching files, and they understand uh, the anatomical abnormality, and it's not just anatomical information. In each patient, uh, there is a associated vector, clinical information, demographic information. I showed uh, that big vector that is associated to each clinical uh, anatomical phenotype. It's is stored in his brain, and when new patient comes, he apply this knowledge to reach uh, the best possible uh, diagnosis. So this is uh, quite a uh, paradigm shift in terms of study design for me. This is more like a chess game. You have to have a knowledge database <laughs> and uh, up, we need an algorithm to apply it, and uh, we want to come up with the best possible uh, move. Now, so to me, I, the classical research uh, paradigm is uh, how we can eliminate the human involvement, uh, no classification, no subjective judgment, uh, but now, uh, our research is more about uh, knowledge creation and learn from human. So that is uh, quite a shift. Then uh, let me go into a little deeper about uh, another type of challenge, and I wanna come back to this slide. Again, uh, there are many patients, and each patient carries information. This is big data, actually. Uh, and uh, this is bad kind of big data, uh, which is called shallow depth wide width big data. Even if we have 10,000, 100,000 patient information, each patient carries one million box cell times T1, T2, TTI. And then one genetic field carries three billion base pairs. So it's hugely wide and shallow. And in classical research design, we assume we can homogenize the patient population so that these are all Alzheimer patients. Therefore, there is a consistent property in the vertical column so that we can do the population averaging try to reduce the big data vertically. However, if we assume that none of them are a strongly discriminating factor, and they are different, every each patient are different, we cannot do this data contraction vertically. This is similar to chess game. We want to record all the moves made by human, and I'm not sure you want to average and reduce the data in the knowledge field. Then inevitably, the, the key of uh, the data analysis is the reduction of the horizontal uh, direction. And uh, I myself believe in this data reduction is really 
uh, the key. And for example, if this is genetic data, instead of using three billion pair raw data, most obvious way of data reduction is just looking at genes, uh, 500, 1,000 selected genes. That's a huge reduction, three billion to 1,000. If it's blood sample, we just uh, measure uh, 20 items. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, there are no information left after this uh, automated analysis of the blood. <laughs> Inevitably, reduction uh, leads to the loss of data, but so it is really an art of reducing data with, uh, with minimum information loss. And then when it comes to image, the data reduction has to be in location domain because we have one million voxel coordinate that really kills us. Now, let's go to completely the other side and look at uh, what information radiologists record. So this is one example. The ventricle, cortical sulci, and uh, cisternal spaces are enlarged for the patient's age consistent with global mild volume loss. So I, I painted, uh, the blue is talking about extent, mild, moderate, severe, and red is mode, shape change, small, large, intensity, bright, dark. Up to here, uh, it's not that much of uh, big data. But as soon as we go to the location, that is where uh, the devil is. Now, however, in, in the daily radiological report, they reduce the inf location information into several nouns, like ventricles, cortical sarsi, cisternal spaces. Global is not really name, but uh, that means entire brain, I guess. So somehow uh, they com the, the one million voxel information comes into their brain, apply filter, and spits out this location name. So this is uh, what we want to know uh, how they do it. And when it comes to location, we usually have two different representations. One is, if, if this is art map, it's longitude, latitude. Uh, our GPS, I believe, uh, operate on this coordinate system. Uh, it has to be, I guess, meta resolution to precisely identify where you are. When the resolution is very high, the coverage is very small, if it's climate uh, mapping, you, you, I don't think you need meta resolution, but you need bigger coverage. The other way is political map that define country, state, city, and streets. The same art. And even though longitudinal latitude, uh, longitude latitude coordinate system has complete information in it, it is not always the one you want. For example, if you want to define the property your, of your house boundary, you don't want to record the correction of the coordinate. You just want a map showing the boundary. If you want to deliver the mail, you don't want the, I guess postman doesn't want the longitude latitude coordinate, they want country, state, city, and streets number. Likewise, when we look at the brain, uh, we can uh, change the coordinate system uh, from one millimeter, two millimeter, to 80 millimeter resolution. Uh, as we decrease the resolution, uh, obviously, the, the amount of the information reduces. So this is one way to reduce information. But I believe what the radiologist does is they reduce the information based on more similar to political map. One of anyway. So so I, I guess in in the brain MRI, one of the key is the system to refer to the location, not by coordinate, but by name. And as the, again, the earth can be uh, divided into political map or seven, uh, five continent and seven seas or time zone, the same brain can be uh, divided into different structures with different criteria. So this is not a done 
deal. Uh, depending on what you want, uh, the way we want to segment brain may be different, but I guess one of the most natural way is to divide them in, uh, based on uh, classical anatomical structure representation. So that is one of the things we are trying to develop uh, from uh, most uh, core segmentation, which corresponds to the country name, I guess. And uh, there is a hierarchical relationship uh, all the way to uh, uh, about 300 structures we can clearly define using MRI. So now once we establish this structure uh, representation and assign name, uh, we now can link uh, the, radi the way radiologists record uh, their observation and uh, the way we quantify the brain. Now, then uh, the question is how we uh, divide segment the brain like this. And there are many ways uh, to uh, divide the brain. There are tools like free software, FSL, and uh, we have we, we also have MR Studio that uh, does the automated uh, brain segmentation. But the, this technology has uh, developed considerably in last ten years when this multi atlas uh, segmentation tool becomes widely available. Uh, again, this I can see the common theme of knowledge versus one individual. Basically, we prepare a large amount of fully segmented atlas. Uh, now we have, uh, at this moment, 86 atlases uh, aged from 4 to 90 years old. And when a patient comes, uh, one of the most obvious way is to pick up uh, about 10 atlases based on the age and use this knowledge to uh, come up with the best uh, estimation of the where about the structure. For example, here is a thalamus, and this atlas uh, be, uh, cast this information into this patient and uh, have opinion about where is the thalamus. And in this case, we have uh, eight opinions about where is the thalamus, and then we have to have some kind of uh, arbitration process to, uh, for the best guess. If we can assume this uh, technology is matured enough to give uh, uh, accurate segmentation of the brain, then we can reduce the one million voxel information into a table. These are uh, part of 300 structures we identify, and these are the volumes, for example. And this, this is uh, another case. And if we have age much control, average plus minus standard deviation, we can do uh, something very similar to blood test. These numbers with blue colors are outside the normal range, more than three standard deviation away. And then uh, we can convert a set of MRI images into this standardized barcode like uh, representation, which we call a brain print, like a fingerprint. Uh, what it does is uh, the columns are hundreds of structures we define and the lowest one is the volume of each defined structure, uh, T2 intensity, FA intensity, mean diffusivity of entire uh, uh, structures we define. So in this case, we have uh, 200 times four <laughs> matrices from this person, this person, and this person. So this is uh, the example of data reduction and standardization. Uh, to, to me, the, the raw images uh, in, in the voxel coordinate are somewhat akin to uh, blood sample stored in the freezer. Uh, after this type of conversion, I'm not saying this bar graph captured all the important anatomical feature. It's just one attempt. But in this way, we try to convert the, the raw data into information that uh, computers can understand. So uh, after that, uh, I want to uh, give some uh, presentation of uh, our MRI Cloud platform. Uh, the, the idea is uh, the medical information field is uh, no doubt a big data. It, it, to me, it looks like a large goo. 
And I, I believe many people are trying to bring in a large data analysis tool into it. However, it's very complex. And uh, if I use the analogy of uh, travel business, uh, they are very successful. And the reason they are successful, I believe, is that each airline companies, rental car companies, hotels has very uh, established vertical columns, which is available through internet. And what we try to do is establish one vertical column, very narrow vertical column, within this medical information field, which is MRI and just brain. And then uh, we pull the data out from medical information database and run through MRI crowd service, turn it into uh, the brain print, and bring it back to uh, the structured uh, medical information database. Simultaneously, what we can do is we keep collecting this barcode, not the raw data, and make a database. And once it hits critical mass, maybe we can uh, start knowledge-based interpretation of uh, each patient. The question is why cloud? Uh, we have uh, this MRI Studio software, uh, which is distribution model. You download the software and everything happens in your local computer client. Uh, but we are uh, moving the entire platform, this cloud uh, system, uh, because we start to see a many, many uh, advantage. For example, uh, the, the computational cost of multi atlas segmentation is uh, uh, very large, and we need very good computers. And we apply for grant for national computation research, like uh, San Diego Gordon computer, uh, Texas Stampede computer, and uh, they are willing to give us millions of CPU time for free. And uh, we can make it available freely uh, to users. So users just submit the data, data go to supercomputer, and then uh, get uh, the, the processing done. And we can have segmentation algorithm uh, attached to it, and uh, it's platform free. Uh, version control is so easy because uh, there is only one copy of the executable and uh, we don't have to redistribute it. Uh, so that uh, re significantly reduces the burden to developers. And then uh, we have Atlas resources. I said there are 86 addresses and I hope by the end of this year we will have two to 300 addresses. It undergoes frequent version. And we cannot think that uh, we keep distributing uh, the Atlas resources to all uh, uh, users and make, uh, make sure they're all updated. And uh, another thing is uh, we, I, I show that uh, we want to uh, develop this database as uh, <laughs> The, the way it works is when you submit the data, we will provide the option, uh, uh, you, do you want to erase this data uh, within a few weeks, or are you willing to donate this barcode to us? In, in this way, uh, we, have a, we can build a normal and clinical uh, database of normal and clinical, uh, so that can be one way to uh, build a, a large database. And, and uh, th th these boxes can interact very easily in, in the cloud platform. So uh, I guess it's almost time. No, it's good. You can oh, OK. Out. It's still green. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. OK, so as I said, uh, th th this interface was developed by Anatomy Works uh, by SBI Grant. And as we develop the interface, we, we, we move to this MRI cloud uh, with platform, which is uh, freely available to any users. But uh, the latest uh, uh, functions has been tested in, in this uh, test site. And uh, you can see that there is segmentation and DTI. Uh, segmentation, it 
is basically MP rage, T1 based uh, image and diffusion tensor imaging. Uh, you can upload for the DTI processing and uh, DTI based white matter segmentation. Uh, but uh, at this point, uh, T1 based uh, segmentation is most advanced. Uh, so uh, there's a batch processing mode and single uh, processing mode. So you, we, we, we would love to accept your DICOM data right from the scanner, but because of the HIPAA issue, uh, you, you have to download uh, one small program into your computer and the data is converted to simple raw image and a very, uh, very small number of parameter like a pixel size, matrix size. And then you can upload this uh, header information and image information after this local filtering, and uh, you can specify uh, demographic. I encourage uh, you to specify at least age. There's a information field. Uh, this is based on ICD-10. Uh, if you want, it's not necessary at all. Uh, and, and it's quite uh, cumbersome to upload all these data for each data. So uh, I don't think uh, users are hugely motivated to fill in this space. And then uh, there's a choice of a computer you wanna use. Uh, the first one is San Diego Gordon. Uh, soon uh, Texas Stampede is available. Uh, this is uh, our computer in, in uh, Johns Hopkins. And uh, the Atlas set, we have adult Atlas, pediatric Atlas, uh, and the most uh, latest address caused the problem in Gordon computer, so now it's disabled, but uh, I hope it's gonna come back soon. And then uh, we can submit the data. Uh, and you can monitor the progress, and uh, once it's done, uh, you get blue light on, and you can see the result. And this is the data you submitted. Uh, And this is uh, one of the most, uh, the coarsest uh, segmentation level in which only five structures are defined. For example, one of the structures is left hemisphere. And if you click it, you can see uh, that uh, this is uh, your data and this is the the control data from uh, about four years old to 90 years old. And you can see this data is alive. That means in MongoDB, as we add data, it's automatically uh, reflected in this uh, data. So this is an example of uh, accumulating knowledge as a barcode and use that information to evaluate single subject. And when it's red, that means uh, bigger compared to uh, compared to age match control. I, I, in this case, I just put bogus age. So obviously, this person was not this old. Uh, this is a young adult, so it's, it's supposed to be here. And then the ventricle is obviously uh, too small. Uh, so this is the platform to to deploy and test uh, new image analysis tool uh, hope that is hopefully uh, adopted uh, in, in clinical practice in the future. And as you go down this hierarchical relationship, you can see more and more structures are defined. And uh, for example, in level three, you can see brains are uh, separated to uh, frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, and uh, all the way to uh, the 290 structures. And if, if we try to match uh, radiological report noun, location noun of radiological report, they are mostly in uh, level one, two, three area, country, state, city. They, they rarely go into the street level. Now, another interesting uh, direction of the study is, for example, I identify, click one of the structures, 
And then there is a, this J2 MRI inventory. And if you use this, we can search the clinical database that had a abnormality in this particular structure you specified. This is based on a single structure search, which may not be very useful clinically. Uh, in, in, in the future, we want to submit the entire brain print and do the pattern recognition uh, to identify similar uh, a patient with similar anatomical phenotype. Uh, and uh, we are sitting on more than 6,000 clinical uh, data to try to deploy that information here so that you can uh, do the search. Now, three, in this case, three cases hit, and uh, you can look into the the, the patient uh, uh, text, uh, non-image information, as well as you can call, uh, okay, you can call the image. And uh, this is actually the, the, the same case uh, I showed the radiological report. The radiological report said ventricle is large, tissue had global mild atrophy. That was the reading. You can see it because this patient is a, eight point six years old. So uh, many radiologists can uh, immediately tell the, the, this ventricle cannot be this large. If we look at the lower level, uh, at whole brain level, that, that perfectly agree with radiologist reading because tissues are all green and ventricles are red. However, if we go to lower level, we start to see little more than that. That is, the frontal lobe, parietal lobe is very green, which is a off like that. But <coughs> temporal lobe is very well preserved. And if we sh are shown that, you can see that uh, that is actually the case. Uh, you can see that uh, this part has more atrophy than this part. So I I'm not really aiming that, uh, to say that the quantitative an analysis is better than uh, uh, human reading. Uh, and we do have segmentation errors now uh, here and there. So it's not perfect. But uh, I, I guess the, the, the take home message is uh, it is very important to try to approach, the technology should approach to human <laughs> rather than try to human, try to uh, uh, accept our technology. And I guess uh, that's concluded my presentation today, and I would like to acknowledge uh, all my colleagues, especially Mike Mira, who uh, does most of the algorithm work of this uh, platform. And thank you. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk. I would like on behalf of Timmy and the Brain ah. Imaging Center here to give you this small ah. uh, token you. of our appreciation. And thank you also very much for making such inroads and such a contribution to something that's also extremely relevant to the Brain Imaging Center here, which is going from scan to a spreadsheet, basically, translationally across neuropsychiatric disorders in such a wonderful way. So thank you very Thanks. much. Um, any questions? Let's start with a few questions for the talk. So um, the point of reduction and data reduction is very well made. How do we go from one million by one billion to something that is uh, manageable? So that was a wonderful uh, point. So the question would be then how do you not throw the baby with the bathwater a little bit? So how do you decide then what would be your most meaningful data bytes? Uh, data reduction is art, I believe. There's no single right answer. 
and uh, we can never escape from the, the curse of dimensionality. I guess that's, that's the bot, uh, fundamental. Uh, we, we, the only thing we can do is, is uh, in this case, it's hypothesis-driven uh, segmentation. And as I said, uh, along this kind of segmentation, we might have thrown away a lot of uh, important information. And sorry, I don't have answer to that question. Yeah. Just uh, uh, one point uh, on that slide. You said what is the uh, uh, utility of translational imaging or the step-by-step -step, uh, 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 items for translational imaging except the utility to patient and that sort of thing. And I think perhaps the one thing we all aspire uh, to is uh, reimbursement by CMS. And, uh, that, and uh, for example, MR spectroscopy is a very cool technology. We've used it to uh, suggest that, uh, say, a college student has a brain tumor, uh, but now currently, for whatever reason, it, it uh, has uh, fallen out of favor. And some, some of my residents are, are, more, uh, are uh, more mercenary, and they'll say, uh, why should I learn this? It's not reimbursed by CMS. But yeah, right, that is like uh, to, uh, think that you should learn it. Very uh, significant obstacle in real life. Yeah. But thank you. Great talk. Thanks. So my question is, uh, do you see uh, this is a future application of the, um, the cloud technology or data reduction in the, the drug discovery or the translational, the non-clinical research, and eventually uh, to uh, develop a imaging-based biomarker for clinical trials or in the drug dis in the industry, in the drug industry? M maybe. I, I, I that is a one uh, research direction that some of us uh, are trying, but uh, I myself uh, is going into deep into the radiological diagnosis, but uh, that, that's possible too. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you very much for a lovely presentation. My question is quite technical, really. So in the MRI cloud application that you showed us, you accept clinical data sets that have a three millimeter slice. How does your segmentation pro uh, program okay. deal with really small structures? That's like a very the good question. When we apply this MRI cloud to research, uh, we can expect there is one millimeter MP range and two millimeter uh, uh, T2. Most of them are not available in the clinical scan. And one thing, as I said, uh, 10 years ago, we tried to talk with uh, clinical division, and the only thing they accepted was mp uh, It has been already acquired for tumor patient for surgery navigation, and that is a minimum requirement. Now, T2, we have been facing stiff opposition of adopting high-resolution T2, and I don't think it's going to change. In the clinical setting, we have to segment the brain by T1 and bring it to the co-registered T2. So high resolution can go to low resolution, but low resolution cannot go to high resolution. But uh, we, we haven't even started the intensity profile yet. We're still talking about shape and size and atrophy. So, Sumo, very quick question, and, and I wanted to see if you uh, make a little comment on the aspect of HIPAA compliance and how are you managing this with your institution? Uh, at this point, uh, we have accepted only the research data from the external source. Mm -hmm. uh, whether the clinical data can be accepted by using this local filtering, I don't know. Okay. Very good. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much for Thanks. a wonderful talk.